Welcome everybody to this uh, belated beginning to our musings for tonight. And uh, thanks to Debbie and Terry McGonigal and Henry DeGraff and uh, other people. We're ready to rock and roll here. So uh, our program is musings at the juncture of faith and culture in the 21st century. And over the last 11 years, we've had something like 25 different programs looking at different issues. And tonight we're gonna to look at the role of women in church and society. And I found a postcard from seven years ago that said we had a program on women in ministry celebrating 60 years of women as ordained clergy in the Presbyterian church. The speaker was the Reverend Dr. Joyce DeGraff. The Reverend Dr. Joyce DeGraff is sitting next to me and she will introduce our speaker for this evening. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Hi, everyone. Joyce here. Hey, I was so honored to be asked uh, to speak about Catherine for a few moments before she speaks and tells us just about everything. Oh, we're gonna adjust it. I guess I'm not, I'm not as tall as Jim. <laughs> anyway, her, I love her title. I think I should stand up. <laughs> no. Yeah, hey folks. We had Plug some technical sure. difficulties, but now we're okay. Hi, computer. Plug it into and your computer with power. I'm trying to get power running through the computer to your All right. right. Like, you know, wife's not. Okay, everyone. Um, I came over to be with Patty and Jim because we thought it would be more fun. <laughs> and here I am. Um, I'm very intrigued by Catherine's title, No Room in the Pulpit for Me. And there isn't there isn't a, a female pastor who has, has not wondered about that very thing. But Catherine, as a teenager, she knew she wanted to become a preacher, even then, and she stuck with it. She was born in Crockett, Texas, and uh, married in 1959. She uh, was blessed with two children, Yolanda and Vincent, but sadly, Vincent died at age 17 in a car accident. She has a BA in sociology from Cal State and a Master of Divinity degree from Fuller Seminary. She has been active in two denominations, the Missionary Baptist Church and their traditions and our own Presbyterian Church as well. She has worked with Dr. Isaiah Jones, and she became pastor. Uh, she's become pastor. We're dealing with the computer here. She's um, also culminated a wonderful career as pastor of First Presbyterian Church in LA. Now she says she's retired, but she's not. She's still preaching almost every Sunday somewhere, and she's in great demand. She reminds us all when she preaches her motto, remember, and I quote, remember only what you do for Christ will last. Catherine's my dear friend, and she has much to say. We look forward to hearing from her. You go, girl. <laughs> thank you, Joyce. And thank you for being such a loving and caring neighbor. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, I come as humble as I know how, thanking you for the opportunity to share my story as your servant to your people. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. Good evening, everyone, wherever you may be, and I'm sorry for the delay. We never know when we are using these electronic devices. 
I want to thank the committee for asking me to share my Christian journey to becoming a clergywoman. I will start by reading a Facebook message that I received on Juneteenth this year. This is a person who grew up Baptist as I did and is between 12 and 15 years my junior. I will not use his name, but I will use a fictitious name, John Williams. This is the message, and I received it on Juneteenth this year, June 19th. And he writes, Juneteenth is special to me for many reasons. It was on June 19, 1960, that I was licensed to preach the gospel. I was nine years old when I felt the stirring of the spirit at seven years old in 1957 and 58. The black church refused to tell me to wait until I was grown. Three days after I claimed that I was called to preach, I was preaching at Wednesday night service. So for the last 62 years, I have lived by that Juneteenth spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is for freedom that Christ has freed me. Now I want you to keep in mind that I'm talking about John Williams, not Catherine Hughes right now. John Williams wrote this Facebook message. My response to his message was, so inspiring, John, and I am so proud of you. I don't want to sound disrespectful, but being male was in your favor. I had a similar, similar call at an early age while at Second Baptist Church. But because I was female, I was not allowed to pursue my call. And this was John's response to my comments. He says, I get it. It was very different with girls and women. If you were not recognized at Second Baptist Church, it is doubtful that you would have been recognized by any other black church. I'm so glad your gifts were finally acknowledged. Reading this Facebook message from John and his response to my comment regarding his message made me mad and it made me sad. But it made me also look back and reflect on my life as a young girl beginning with my Christian journey that would eventually lead to me to being ordained as a clergywoman. It took almost 50 years. I looked at Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I thought, John either took it out of context or it only applied to little boys and men. It certainly didn't apply to me that way. And isn't this the same Paul who wrote in 1 Corinthians 14 that women should keep silent in the church? The other thing that upset me is I did expect John to say, I'm sorry, Catherine, that you were treated that way. No, you heard what he said. He said, I get it. No, you don't, John. You don't get it. You don't get it. Not many people get it. Not many women get it. And so I'm going to begin this journey, beginning with my Christian journey. 
As Joyce has already said, I was born in Crockett, Texas. My mother was Baptist and my dad was CME. CME is Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. At that time, it was Colored Methodist Episcopal Church. The name was changed in 1956 and then it became Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and it still bears that name. Well, then there was a schism in the Bell family. Bell is my maiden name. Mother Baptist, father CME, Christian Methodist. Now, I know many uh, Presbyterians started out being Baptist. And we know that Baptists, many if not most, believe that if you are not, that you are not a Christian, if you have not been baptized by total immersion, being dumped in the water and brought up with the devil already washed off of you and left down there in the water, amen. So my dad, as according to my mother, was not really baptized and he needed to be baptized. So within that schism, my mother won and my dad was baptized at the St. Luke Baptist Church where the Reverend Woodall was pastor. I was seven years old and I got to witness my dad's baptism, hallelujah. Our family moved to California in 1945 and we joined the Victory Baptist Church. About a month ago, it was reported on the news that the historic Victory Baptist Church had burned on Saturday night, just about a month ago. It was sad news for the congregation and for the greater Los Angeles area. So here we are in Los Angeles, and it's now around 1948. And we moved near Second Baptist Church. It was our first single dwelling residence, a rental house with one bedroom, one bath. Prior to that, we were renting rooms and sharing the bath and kitchen with other renters. We joined Second Baptist Church the first African-American Baptist church in Los Angeles. It was built in 1885. The current building was built in 1926 and is an historical cultural monument and on the National Register of Historic Places. The Reverend Dr. J. Raymond Henderson was the pastor a graduate of Virginia Union University. Second Baptist Church has been an important force in the civil rights movement, hosting national conventions of the NAACP, the National Baptist Convention USA, and also serving as the site of the important speeches by Martin Luther King Jr., by Malcolm X, by Muhammad Ali and others. In 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. was our Youth Day speaker. And I had the opportunity to ride in the car with he and his lovely wife, Coretta, in a parade after church. My family were members at Second Baptist, but not very active. One night, we had a fire in our home and lost almost everything we had. We could not afford to move, so we continued to live in that house during the repairs. One day, the Mission Society at Second Baptist Church came to our home bearing gifts, food and clothing and money 
to help us get back on our feet. We started attending on a regular basis. Mother joined the choir and she had to audition at that time to be a member of the choir. Dad joined the usher board. I joined the BYF, the Baptist Youth Fellowship. I attended youth meetings. I attended Sunday school, sang in the choir, attended youth camp, attended youth conventions and convocations. I saw women and young girls give speeches and pray and lead worship but they never spoke from the pulpit. I heard many reasons why women could not speak from the pulpit. Some said it was because women are unclean, because we had a menstrual cycle. A woman could not be over a man and have leadership over a man. A lot of stories like this, but none of it made sense to me. But being in these, involved in these activities allowed me to feel God's spirit drawing me to him, to serve him by serving others, to study the Bible and pray. I learned to pray. And my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Daly, would call on me every Sunday to pray. She called on me so much that I decided I would come late every Sunday. So she would ask somebody else. But guess what? She would wait until I arrived and walked through the door and she would say, now we will have prayer by Catherine Bale. I was elected president of the Baptist Youth Fellowship. And at the end of the year, the president had to give a speech. I wanted to do it, but I was so afraid because I had never done anything like that. I had never spoken before a crowd. Mrs. Daly said, I'll help you, and she did. I was told it went well. I could even speak from the pulpit on that day for that occasion. I grew up in Second Baptist. I got married in 1959. I had two children and I followed my husband to the Holy Light Missionary Baptist Church. The Reverend Richmond Brown was pastor. Holy Light was a storefront church started by Reverend Brown and five others less than a year before I joined and now had over a hundred members. The music and the preaching at Holy Light was more black gospel and Second Baptist Church was more conservative. Um, they sang anthems and spirituals and hymns, and there were no hand clapping. Second Baptist Church was more Presbyterian. There I was at Holy Light. From a tall, steeple, stained glass, historic church, joining a storefront where the pastor did not complete high school. But I tell you, it was there at Holy Light that I first experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. I joined the choir. I led songs. I organized the youth and the young adult fellowship. I was elected president of the Mission Society and became president of the Pacific District Association where I traveled all over the United States to the National Baptist Conventions USA. 
the Lord was using me. And I was glad about it. When I spoke at other churches, people, even other pastors, would say, girl, you preached. I was invited to speak at other churches, but they never allowed me in the pulpit. Some even called me a bootleg preacher. Well, I did this for 17 years at Holy Life. I was busy doing the Lord's work, but something was missing. I was not fulfilled. I was not doing what God had called me to do. I could not fulfill my call because I was born a woman. I was born female. Did God make a mistake? I spoke with Reverend Brown about it. I told him about my call to an ordained ministry. He told me that he believed that God called women to preach. His mother-in-law, Mother McGowan, was a pastor, but had to leave her denomination to start her own ministry and was not treated well by other male pastors. Reverend Brown supported me, but said he could not support me as an ordained minister. He could not license me. He could not ordain me. So I left Holy Light, and I returned to Second Baptist Church, where the Reverend Dr. Thomas Kilgore Jr. was now pastor. Reverend Kilgore was very progressive and had a daughter who had completed seminary and was waiting for a call. Reverend Kilgore was also the first African-American to serve as pastor of the American Baptist Convention, which at that time and still is predominantly white. I learned from others that Reverend Kilgore felt that I had some gifts of ministry. And he did use me at times to lead worship at Second Baptist. Then there was another schism in the church. Second Baptist church split. I went with the split and the eternal promise Baptist church was founded. It was now 1986. Reverend Richard Horton was elected pastor of Eternal Promise Baptist Church. Reverend Horton was associate pastor at Second Baptist Church. Dr. Kilgore brought him to Second Baptist from back east. Reverend Horton started out in Los Angeles as an Episcopal priest. Then he became Baptist, but he supported women clergy. Pastor Horton and I were very close. We had served in ministry together at Second Baptist, and he knew me. Now he was my pastor at Eternal Promise. One day he called to ask me to have lunch with him. I did. He told me. He thought I was called to a preaching ministry. He said, I can feel God's call on your life. I was always told that if you were really called by God to ministry, others would see and feel that spirit. Pastor Horton wanted to license me. I knew he was right. But I was afraid. The Black Baptist Church fellowshiped a lot with other churches. I was afraid that I would not be accepted or supported by other congregations. So I said, no, absolutely not. I went home that night. Couldn't sleep. I was still married. My husband did not understand what was going on. 
So to help me sleep, I remembered a sermon that I had written and preached to myself years ago. This was before I ever thought of being an ordained minister. The scripture text was Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. That was Jesus speaking and giving the great commission. I preached that sermon that night. The sermon topic was, somebody needs to go. That next morning, I got up. I called Pastor Horton and I said, yes. Yes, yes, that was in 1990. February 1990, I preached my first sermon and was licensed and entered Fuller Seminary in September in the American Baptist track. Uh, excuse me, not in the American Baptist track, that's where I left. I, I want to close this with how I became Presbyterian while at Fuller. When Dr. Horton licensed me, he promised that he would not fellowship with churches that did not accept women clergy. One of the ministers, Reverend Willis, who participated in the organizing of Eternal Promise, died suddenly of a heart attack, leaving a wife who had no family in Los Angeles and was going to return to her home on the East Coast. The Progressive Baptist Convention and the Progressive Baptist District Association, much like a presbytery, and the American Baptist Convention held a farewell service for Mrs. Willis and a service of memory for Dr. Willis. The president of the American Baptist Convention was pregnant, present, traveled many miles to be there. Pastor Horton was scheduled to preach. And so our congregation was there these presidents were there, district presidents and other congregations. This was an afternoon service, a service of praise. Pastor Harden and I arrived at the church about the same time. Pastor Horton invited me to the pastor's study where the ministers were. I was sitting there, the only woman when a man came to the door and he motioned for me to come to him, I went. He said to me, we don't allow women in the pulpit. I got my purse and returned to the sanctuary where our congregation was. Now remember, this church has no pastor. Dr. Willis, their pastor died suddenly. And so the deacons were in charge. My congregation asked, why did I leave the study? Well, I told them, the deacon said I couldn't go in the pulpit. They asked me, did Pastor Harden know? I said, no. So someone went and told Pastor Harden. Pastor Harden came, he heard my story, went to get his hat, and he and the congregation were in the process of leaving the service. I tried to stop him. This is what I feared when I did not want to be licensed, that we would have this kind 
of confusion, Pastor Horton reminded me that he said when he licensed me that he would not fellowship with churches that did not support clergy women. Just then that deacon who had called me aside to tell me I was not welcome in the pulpit arrived and heard the conversation. Remember, Pastor Horton was scheduled to preach that night. The deacon said he would make an exception and let me in the pulpit. Pastor Horton said, no, absolutely not. I finally said to Pastor Horton, okay, Pastor, uh, let's do it. Because at that time I was feeling embarrassed and hurt. I said, let's do it. And so we stayed and Pastor Horton preached. But it was then that I knew that I had to leave the Baptist church to find a more clergy woman friendly denomination. I prayed, others prayed for me to make the right decision. Three ministers that I knew, not knowing what the other had said to me, asked me to speak with the Reverend Dr. Isaiah Jones, Jr., pastor at the Community United Presbyterian Church before I made my decision. I did. I spoke with Pastor Jones. The rest is history. <laughs> January 1992, I joined the Community United Presbyterian Church and became Presbyterian. I graduated Fuller in 1994 with a Master of Divinity degree and was ordained in 1998 and became pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Los Angeles. I retired in 2003. And then in 2004, I went to work to serve at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church as the visitation pastor. I was there from 2004 to 2012. And then I served at St. Paul's Presbyterian Church for 10 years as a pulpit supply. And then I served Palms Presbyterian Church from that time until now, I still serve. I preach there at least once a month. I'm still serving. But what all of this has said to me and what I've come to realize is that God uses ordinary women and ordinary people in general to do God's will in the world. And I say to you women, men, boys and girls, if God is calling you to serve God's people, be like Isaiah and say, here am I, Lord, send me. Because I tell you, there's not a better feeling than to be able to serve God by serving God's people. To God be the glory. Amen. I Catherine, know. I hope you can see everyone applauding for you. And Jim, I need you to unmute. Yes, there we are. Yeah. Oh, Catherine, thank you so much for that beautiful story of uh, your life. And uh, we're, we're inspired by it and uh, excited for you. We're glad you're here at Mount Vista Crow. And uh, uh, let's let's open the program to uh, some questions. So if people want to uh, put a question in the chat or, or simply unmute yourself and, and ask a question. 
we can't see you, so you need to just be brave. Unmute yep. yourself. Just unmute your, mute yourself and. Uh... Um, it's Barbara. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Reverend Horton had a daughter. Um, I'm not sure if I caught the rest of that, but was she inclined, do you think, to consider becoming a pastor? And is that what, why he may have been supportive of your ministry? It was Reverend Kilgore who had a daughter, she's still living, mm -hmm. who had finished seminary and was waiting for a call. Oh, right. She did get a call and she's still in ministry. Mm -hmm. Good. That's amazing. Catherine, we have a comment in the chat from Reverend Carol Habersham. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing your story. You're quite welcome. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you were, uh, your way was blocked uh, many times over and over again. Uh, do you feel like the situation has changed for the better, that it's now uh, easier for women to be in the pulpit? Or are we still uh, back to the time when, when too many people are not allowed in the pulpit? Well, obviously it has changed to some. It is still a struggle for women uh, to get a call. And you can tell that by the number of women here at Monte Vista Grove who are ordained. I think there are seven of us out of uh, maybe over a hundred residents. We can tell that by those who pastor churches in the Presbyterian church, certainly more than there were 10, 15 years ago. The American Baptist Church is now ordaining women. One of the major problems, uh, though, and I hate to say this, is that women don't vote for women pastors. Uh, I think that is a generational thing and a cultural thing. Uh, women are used to men being in leadership positions. We know that we find more male CEOs and more males in leadership positions. It's just that way, it's kind of like racism. I hate to make that comparison, uh, but we've made some changes. And as Dr. King would say, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And so I say to churches, if you're seeking pastors, consider the women. Women make great pastors, great leaders. So yes, some change, but nowhere it needs to be. No. So Catherine, we have a comment in the uh, chat from Sandra Mater. Thank you, Catherine, for responding to the call to preach. Much love, dear sister. Love um, you. Betty, Glick, Betty Glick has a question. What have you enjoyed the most about being a pastor? Certainly not moderating sessions. <laughs> I think I enjoy most the um, pastoral leadership, um, visiting uh, members who are unable to, to attend the worship services, uh, caring for people who are sick um, and who have lost loved ones. I think that type of ministry is what I'm really called to do. I can't say that I enjoy it, but it gives me the most fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Great. There's a Reverend Yolanda Hughes who says, you are awesome, mama. <laughs> <clears throat> Nancy Mackey, you've had a long journey and have shown great courage. Can you talk about other women you came across who are on the same difficult path? Yes. Uh, growing up and uh, at Second Baptist, as I said before, we joined in 1948. Uh, I actually never saw a female pastor. 
I believe the first female pastor that I saw was when I went to Holy Light, and that was in 1961 or two. And the pastor, Reverend Brown's mother-in-law, Reverend McGowan, uh, was a, an ordained minister and had a church in Phoenix. She was the first. And then there were other women who had been Baptists and who had been members of other denominations, but were not accepted as I was not accepted and who had started their own ministries. And so one night, um, a friend of mine came to me and showed me a, uh, the church newspaper. And he says, this woman is running a revival uh, at a church. She was a, a Baptist pastor. And I said, really, I want to go. And he said, okay, I'll go with you. So we went. Her name was Reverend Catherine Shivers. And I went to hear her. And I was so inspired to see a Baptist woman who was a pastor and who was running a revival in a Baptist church. <laughs> and so Reverend Shivers and I became very close friends uh, until she died about maybe five years ago. Uh, and I, I was, she had said if she died first, she wanted me to do her service, and I did, but I did not have many role models. So Catherine, we have a comment from F. Johnson. Inspired and encouraged to hear my cousin and family matriarch share her ministerial story. To God be the glory for his gift in the person of Reverend Catherine Hughes. Thank you, Felicia. And then we have a question from Tim and Mary Park. What do you think is the biggest hurdle for clergy women today? Uh, the fact that they are not called uh, to fill positions that are vacant in our churches. Uh, most um, epiphs that churches receive and list and hear are from male pastors. The females are basically looked over. And I still think there's that um, idea that women should not be pastors because they should not have authority over men. I do think that there is still some of that. We are unclean, so we cannot baptize people certain times of the month, and we cannot serve communion. Uh, all of these things that happen in the dark ages, many of them continue to happen today. And so until we get leadership, male or female, who are willing to teach congregations that all of this stuff is hogwash and what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 that a woman should keep silent in the church is nonsense because if we kept silent, we really would not have churches because they're filled with women who are speaking, teaching, preaching. And so until we have good teaching in the church, teaching and preaching that does not put women down, it will continue. We have a comment from David Cobb. Thank you for obeying your call. I love you so much. Thank you, cousin David. <laughs> and then we have a, a comment and question from Nancy Hunter. Deciding to change denominations to preach must have been a tough decision. Do you advise those who may not feel completely accepted in their churches to consider more progressive denominations today or make change where they are? Well, today it's easier to make change, I would think, where you are, depending on the convention you're in. If you are Baptist and you are American Baptist, you know there's a possibility of being ordained. But then the other question is, will I receive a call? And you have to look at that. So it's an individual decision. If you are so tied to your, um, your denomination, uh, which I, I was not, uh, then you're gonna stay there and probably not uh, progress as you should. But I was willing to move on because what I wanted to do was to serve God's people in any denomination or a non-denomination if it came to that. 
I'm not tied to denominations unless the theology is just totally way out there. Uh, there's not, uh, you know, a lot from American Baptist Convention. Uh, when, when I look at, at the leadership of the Presbyterian Church with a session, and I look at some of our theodic, theology regarding baptism, I now understand uh, why we um, uh, uh, baptize infants. I understand more about what baptism means. Uh, and so I, if we get to know all of that and we still wanna stick with our denominations, I say do that. For me, that was not the case. We have a hand up from Alfreda. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Um, hi, this is Sharice. Hi, Reverend uh, Hughes. This is uh, Sharice Alfreda's daughter. Hi, Sharice. Hi. I um, was walking by after a long day of teaching, and I, um, you know, I never thought about the struggles that uh, female pastors had in church. They don't, no one ever talks about it. It's never brought to life. And, you know, I, I find it very disturbing because the word of God talks about love and equality and acceptance. And it just seems like politics has weaved its way into the ministry where it's kept women back, um, which, is, which was very unfortunate <clears throat> because I have found that the greatest insights and strengths that I have seen from anyone has been a woman. Even the men in leadership positions have consulted to some woman somewhere. So why wouldn't they be fit to be in the pulpit? So I certainly am hoping now with the way the world is going, whoever can preach the word, whoever can reach someone or some group and draw them closer to God, allow them to do that. You know, allow them to do that, man, woman, child, whomever, um, because we're in a place right now where we, we, we can't afford to shut down those who are bold enough to spread the word and express it. And I'm so grateful to you and all the other women who stepped forward because that was risky. It was risky for you to do that. And um, for those of us who are trailblazing in other industries, I want to thank you for that because it's inspiring to me because I had no idea that this journey occurred. I didn't know, but now I do. And I want to thank you and everyone else who um, proceeded in that journey. Thank you for that. And I just want to share that all of this started with the Bible. Yeah. With this interpretation of the Bible and with the Bible being taught by men. And so, it's, you know, I love men, uh, <laughs> but I hate to say is that some of our leadership, much of it, most of it, in fact, um, could have been stopped even because at, at first I do realize that uh, men nor women had an opportunity to get a theological education. And so they read the Bible and what they got from it, they believed it uh, and they taught it. But now we do have, you know, seminary and Bible college. Uh, we have the Greek and Hebrew. You don't even have to go to seminary to read it, you know, you can get your own Greek and Hebrew Bible with English next to it and learn uh, what is really being said and get an understanding. I think there's something else that happens. It benefits our society for men to remain in power and for women not to be uh, in power. That's the same with the racial issues. Uh, that's the same thing with the LGBTQ, uh, IA uh, community. There are certain groups who have been in power who do not want to let go of that power. And until we get to a point where we're not looking at power or who's in power, but we're looking at what God wants us to do and how God wants us to love each other and to be there for each other and to treat each other, not the way we want to be treated, but to treat others the way they want to be treated. Yes, beautifully said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat and then uh, Reverend Carolyn Habersham has her hand up. So the question first from Betty Glick is what can PCUSA do to encourage more women to become pastors? That's a good question, uh, Betty. Um, 
I think one thing that can be done that would be positive if we can get churches to call women and that other women can see women in leadership and that we also take away some of the of what we've been brought up with that uh, only men can do this, which is not true. I think in certain, certainly in the African-American uh, community, there's certain things that women have, have, have gotten and still get from their male preachers that we women can't give them and don't. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, a woman walks in church and she's dressed down as a woman pastor, I'm probably not going to say, Sister Jones, you sure look good today. <laughs> well, they will get that from some of the male pastors. And some of them need that and want that. And so until we realize that when we attend a worship service and we are attending a worship service and not going to church because we are the church, and that we become the church and be the church, that some of this will disappear. And I think I see that happening uh, in the world today. My daughter is, is a pastor and I know a lot of women pastors, we have uh, clergy women in the National Baptist, Black uh, Baptist, um, not Baptist, the National uh, um, Black Presbyterian Caucus. But we have one church, uh, well, two, but one with an with a, uh, an installed pastor, and that's Janetta Goodjoin uh, out at New Hope. Um, and so, and we have eight, eight churches in that group. So until we have women say, you know, it's over, let's call the best pastor, male, female, doesn't matter, male, female, or uh, other. Let's call the best person who is to be in that position to serve our church. Great. Now, Reverend Carolyn Habersham, I'm going to let you go ahead and um, address a comment you put in the chat as well. Okay, so the comment I put in the chat uh, is from the Wallers from First Presbyterian Church of Los Angeles uh, because they, they're uh, chat is not working. They asked me to do it. Uh, they wanted to thank you, Pastor Hughes, for your service and leadership at First Pres of Los Angeles. They love to hear you sing. It is well with my soul. And thanks for sharing your spiritual journey with First Presbyterian Church. That's God's your comment. I'm going to let you speak to that, and then I have something to say. Yeah, thank you, uh, Catherine and Veronica. Uh, who are still members at First Presbyterian Church of Los Angeles. Uh, it was my pleasure to serve that congregation. I was a new pastor, uh, had no clue of what I was doing. Uh, and uh, that family uh, particularly uh, just took me under their wings and they were there for me. Veronica is the administrative assistant there. Uh, and uh, we just bonded. Uh, they helped me so much. That congregation helped me um, become a pastor because I had no clue of what I was doing. So I thank you all. I love you. God bless you. And I'm looking forward to being there uh, in December. God bless you. And God bless you, Pastor, for your support. Thank you. So my... Um... My comment is this in a question. This is 2022 and women are still having uh, journeys, even in denominations that say that they um, very much accept women. Um, what do you think can happen if there's a woman ordained in another denomination that would want to switch denominations, say come over to the Presbyterian Church. What are the challenges uh, that you see today um, in, in making those type of transitions? And what do you think can happen to lessen those type of transitions, particularly if they're coming from connectional churches? Okay, I've seen it happen so many times with men who come from uh, other churches. Some of them are not even connectional churches. 
and they find a way to get them. Not so with women. But I think it's wonderful when we get a dedicated woman uh, who does not have a call in her own denomination and uh, a church in our denomination wants her. She's good for the congregation. Uh, I have no problem with uh, th that woman becoming prepared and there are ways to do that. Uh, and many Presbyterians are doing it. The, the main reason that I don't think we see a lot of it, and especially in our presbytery, is that we have so many pastors, males and females, waiting for calls. And so to bring someone outside of the Presbyterian church may not sit well uh, with our already uh, waiting uh, pastors who are waiting for calls. But I don't have any problem with it. I do believe that sometimes the Presbyterian Church has too many rules uh, and we lose good people uh, because we're not uh, willing to be flexible uh, with those rules. Right. Um, we have Diane Williams with her hand up and then uh, Jim, I've muted you, but I don't know how much longer we have. Well, let's take, let's take a couple more questions. Okay, so Diane, you wanna unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, that, this has been an incredible evening. And um, I am just so, so privileged to have listened and learned so much more about you, Pastor Hugh. I wanna know, have you written anything? Have you published anything? And if you haven't, why not? Everyone needs to hear this. Diane, I have not, but you know, I've been in the um, writing class uh, for two semesters and I started uh, <laughs> writing, um, not sure what it will turn out to be. I'm um, starting with my life journey. And of course this journey uh, to becoming a clergy woman is a part of that. So no, I have not published anything, but I'm in, the process of doing that. Doing some of it is very painful. In fact, writing this uh, for tonight was painful uh, for me because I, I gave you the good parts, but there were times when I went to a church to speak and I headed to the pulpit and I was stopped and told that I could not go there. Uh, and you know, those are the things that hurt you emotionally. Uh, and they stay with you forever. I'm still told by some male pastors that God is not pleased with me because I'm ordained and I'm, you know, parading around, masquerading uh, as, a, as a preacher and God doesn't call women. So we still have a lot of that nonsense going on. So, um, but back to your questions, no, I have not, uh, publish anything, but hopefully within the next couple of years, uh, I'll finish my writings and maybe we'll have something published. I would like to just say this, if not writing it down, do it on Audible because your voice is powerful. Your message is, is, is powerful and just hearing your voice uh, means so much. So I would purchase an awful of your story uh, uh, immediately. And I know so many others would, and it would make such a difference yeah. to so many people. Thank you so, again. So Diane's breaking up, but just to make sure you heard her, she says you not only should publish, you should also read your book personally on Audible because your voice is so wonderful and mm -hmm. it just brings the story to life. That's great. That, Diane, she loves me, so of course you would say that. <laughs> but I hear, I hear you. Nancy Hunter says, "Amen." <laughs> Do we have other comments or questions? I have a, a, a comment, uh, Debbie. Yes. I want to thank. You, I want to thank you very much, Catherine, for the joy, the courage that you have, and the joy that you 
radiate uh, uh, when you think about your ministry and engage in it and the whole road you have taken and it's taken so much courage at times, I'm sure. Also, uh, it's so good to think about all the talent that is on expressed because of people putting it down because they're a female or uh, gay or whatever. But I'm so proud of you and so glad that you're here uh, at the Grove. Thank you. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat and then we'll go to Mark's iPhone. He has his hand up. Um, Hugh Christopher, two of the churches I served back east are struggling to find new pastors. So why are so many pastors looking for a call? Is it primarily women who are waiting for calls or men as well? Well, I, th I think it's both men and women are waiting for call. Problem is th the advertising in the Presbyterian church is not good. Uh, it, it's in certain areas, if you have a position in a certain presbytery, it may not get out of that presbytery. Uh, you know, so there, there needs to be a better system uh, in making it known to the Presbyterian Church USA that there are positions available and that we are willing to accept the most qualified person. And until we find ways to make that clear, I don't see any changes. We need to make it very clear that there are positions. I agree with you, Hugh, there are positions. Uh, and so it, it needs to be made known. Okay, we'll go to Mark's iPhone. Mark? Is that, is that yes, Mark? Yes, it is Mark Jones. Hi, Pastor. Mark. Hello, hello. I just wanted to it to be on the record that you have made the declaration that it's your family that loves you. And so they will say all those nice things, but I'm here to declare, I think we all love you. And uh, we probably love you more than your family does. Cause you know, you know, you squabble in your family. So thank you so much for sharing uh, Pastor Hughes. Great. Thank you, Mark, and I love you as well. And I'm very proud to be a part of MBPC and a part of a part of Pacific Presbytery, who has been very supportive uh, of me. I must say, our EP Linda Culbertson uh, from the beginning has been in my corner, uh, and the members of the, our National Black Presbyterian Caucus president and members have always supported me, even after my retirement, always make sure that I'm included in the preaching for Advent and for, um, for Lent and for Black history, for whatever, I appreciate that. I'm 86 years old and God still blesses me with these opportunities to bless others. So I love you, I've seen you grow and I'm seeing, Glad to see where you are today and uh, take care of yourself. I know what you've gone through in these last few years. Take care of yourself. I love you. So Catherine, we, we have a, a little disagreement here. Your daughter says, no, no, no. We love her to the moon and back. Of course. Of course. And then Diane Williams, you have your hand up. Diane, you need to unmute yourself. I don't know how to put my hand down. <laughs> oh, let me lower it for you. Oh, thank okay. you. Okay. Anyone else? Well, Debbie, I think maybe we'll draw things together here. Uh, what I've heard, Catherine, from so many people is how much you are loved. And we, we all love you to the moon and back. I, I, I like that statement. Absolutely. And uh, Perhaps the, the issues related to women in ministry uh, 
are moved a little bit along tonight because we've had, this is one of the largest audiences we've ever had for a musings talk. Uh, I just saw uh, it was uh, over 60, well, pro there are probably 90 people here. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big audience. And, and the issues you've raised, we are thinking about and concerned about and just thank you so much for uh, for being you. We love having you here at Monte Vista Grove, and uh, we'll do our best to support the issues you've raised, and particularly inviting women to be ministers of churches. Thank you so much for joining us. We we had a difficult start, but here it's uh, it's almost eight thirty, and we still have a big crowd. So thank you for being part of it. And uh, we'll have another musings in February. Mm -hmm. So look forward to it. Right. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night.